to a scripture and we're going to read uh, this very important incident in the Old Testament and then I want you to sing a chorus which is based upon it. It's number 24, isn't that yes. one there? Now the passage I want to read with you is Exodus chapter 12. The book of Exodus chapter 12. And I presume you know what the book of Exodus is about. It is about the exodus of the children of Israel from Egypt. And that's why it's called by that name. All right then, here it is in chapter 12, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of month. It shall be the first month of the year to you. They were to start their calendars all over again. And this month, the month of their exodus was to be the first month, the January, so to speak, of the Hebrew calendar. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it, according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it and they shall eat the flesh in that night roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it eat not of it raw nor boiled at all with water but roast with fire his head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Verse 21, Then Moses called for the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your fathers and kill the Passover. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop that was a weed that grew in the cracks in the wall. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin and none of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptian and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you verse 29 and it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night he and all his servants and all the Egyptians and there was a great cry in Egypt for there was not a house 
where there was not one dead. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. And now there's a lovely little chorus that I don't know where it's printed. I just heard it and someone wrote out the tune and harmonies. And it's right on this beautiful subject. I'm under the blood of Jesus, safe in the shepherd's fold. I'm under the blood of Jesus, safe when the world grows old. Safe when the nations tremble. Safe when the stars grow dim. I'm under the blood of Jesus and I am safe in him. You'll find it easy to pick up, but I'm going to sing it to you first and then we'll try and learn the words and sing it. Here is the, here's the tune. I'm under the blood of Jesus, saved in the shepherd's fold. I'm under the blood of Jesus, safe when the world grows old. Safe when the nations tremble, safe when the stars grow dim. I'm under the blood of Jesus, and I am safe in Him. Amen. That's what the firstborn of the Israelite homes might well have sung, had he known that the lamb that secured his safety was typifying God's dear son. Now the words are very simple. I want you to say them after me, like the children do. You pick it up that way. We haven't got it in front of us. I'm under the blood of Jesus, safe in the shepherd's fold. I'm under the blood of Jesus, safe. I'm under the blood of Jesus, safe when the world grows old. Safe when the nations tremble. Safe when the stars grow dim. I am under the blood of Jesus and I am safe in him. Wonderful word, safe. And there's only one place where you could be safe. And that's under the blood of Jesus. Now, let's try and sing it. Um, if you don't know this tune too well, make up one you do know. And if it doesn't harmonize, we'll try again on that. Uh, and if you forget a word, sing La till you come to a word you do know, but I'll try and coach you as we come along. I'm under the blood of Jesus, safe in the shepherd's fold. I'm under the blood of Jesus. Safe in the shepherd's fold I'm under the blood When the world grows old Safe when the world Safe when the nations tremble Safe when the nations tremble Safe when the stars Safe when the stars grow dim I'm under the blood of and I am safe and I am safe in here once again I'm under the blood of Jesus fold safe in the shepherd's fold I'm under the world when the world grows old, safe when the world grows the nations, safe when the nations trip the stars, safe when the stars grow dim. I'm under the blood of Jesus and I am safe in him. Well, the nations are trembling these days and the day is going to come when the stars are going to grow dim and the elements are going to dissolve with fervent heat. But if you're under the blood of Jesus, you are safe eternally. Should we sing it just once again so that you remember it? And we'll try these two new choruses in later meetings. So we're uh, 
uh, laying up a store for coming days and brother you must feel free to pick them up and uh, include them I'm under the blood of Jesus Safe in the shepherd's fold I'm under the blood of Jesus When the world Safe when the world grows old When the nations Safe when the nations tremble Safe when the stars grow dim I'm under the blood of Jesus And I am safe in Him Amen We've read this evening That graphic story of how in the hour when God was smiting the firstborn in the land of Egypt and indeed judging the gods of Egypt Israel, God's ancient people, were saved and in particular I want to read to you again that twelfth verse of that twelfth chapter of Exodus or the thirteenth verse and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are and when I see the blood I will pass over you and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt now this incident gives us a wonderful picture of how God provide salvation for his people in a world under the judgment of God yes the land of Egypt was indeed under his judgment God had brought plague after plague to fall, fall upon Pharaoh and his kingdom in order to induce him to let his people go nine of them but still it was to no avail he stiffened his neck he hardened his heart and he refused to let them go and so it was that God said yet will I bring one plague more a last one after that he will let you go indeed he will thrust you out all together and that last plague was a dreadful one at the appointed hour in the midst of the night the firstborn in every Egyptian home died from the firstborn of Pharaoh in the palace to the firstborn in the dungeon and it even extended to the firstborn of cattle and it was a solemn judgment that Egypt couldn't afford to ignore that great act of God in the hour of that judgment Israel however were to be saved and this was the manner of their saving each home was to take for themselves a lamb they were to keep that lamb from the tenth day to the fourteenth day presumably to assure themselves that there was no blemish in it and on the fourteenth day as the sun was setting each home would take that lamb outside and they would slay the little innocent creature they would catch the base, the blood in a basin and they would pull a hyssop weed out of the wall and make it into some sort of a brush and then they would dip it in the blood in the basin and sprinkle the doorposts and the upper doorposts of the houses wherein they were with that blood and the promise God had given them was this when I see the blood sprinkled there upon the doorposts of your house in this dread hour when the firstborn of Egypt began to die but when I see the blood I will pass over you and so it, is, so it was that while Egypt were mourning their dead 
and a great cry went through the land Israel were feasting on the very land whose blood had assured the safety of their firstborn that night everything for Israel depended on the value God put upon that blood and his faithfulness to the promise when I see the blood I will pass over you many a firstborn son might well have felt that he'd done nothing very good indeed the reverse that he deserved to die as much as anybody but God had said it matters not whether you're worthy or not when I see the blood I will pass over you now that's a picture of the way God saves his people today in a world under the judgment of God this world is under God's judgment because of its rejection of his son they have not been willing to have this man to reign over them and God has appointed a day in which he will judge this world in righteousness many and grievous disciplines he's brought upon this world in order to bring, men, to bring men back to himself but all to no avail they've stiffened their necks they've refused to return and just as in the story there was one last plague that God brought upon them so there is upon this world coming a last judgment and I saw a great white throne we read in Revelation and one sat upon it from whose face the heavens and the earth fled away and there was found no place for them and I saw the dead small and great stand before God and the books were opened and another book which is the book of life and the dead were judged every man according to the things written in the, in the book and any, everyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was cast, it says, into the, into the lake of fire this is the second death this is the last judgment that God is going to bring upon a proud, impenitent world in that day, however there's going to be a people who are to be saved and are not going to share in the judgment of the world and you and I could be amongst that people if we've any doubt whether we are it's available and open to you for that people who are to be saved in the day of the world's judgment God has provided a lamb God's had him in reserve since the foundation of the world even before sin was committed in Jesus God had provided for that contingency and Jesus is said to be the lamb slain from the foundation of the world and this people to be saved have done something about that lamb they have appropriated his blood each man for himself or to use the imagery of the story in front of us they have sprinkled the blood of Jesus on the doorposts of their hearts and they've done so through repentance of their sins and the faith that says it was for me that blood was shed and in that simple way they have appropriated that blood they've sprinkled it upon the doorposts of their hearts and God has said with regard to them when I see the blood sprinkled there upon the doorposts of your heart I will pass over you it's possible of course for the preacher to take up Old Testament incidents and almost force them of his own will to be pictorial of Christ I, perhaps I might have done that sometimes in my anxiety to find a picture of Jesus in my Old Testament but I don't really need to try very hard it's all there and certainly this one is clearly stated in the New Testament to be a picture of Jesus 
and that redemption which he's accomplished for us. Because in the first epistle of Peter chapter 2 it says, For ye know, ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain manner of life, handed down from your fathers. You were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without spot and without blemish. And there's no doubt at all, when Peter talks of us being redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without spot and blemish, he is definitely referring to this great Passover incident. And Jesus is the antitype of that lamb whose blood assured the safety of the firstborn in Egypt. So we've got good ground for looking at this story in that light. Now this incident not only provides us with a wonderful picture of how God saves men today, but it also provides us with a picture and precious teaching of how the saved may be maintained in daily fellowship with the one who saved them. They are maintained in daily fellowship by the blood of the Lamb, which blood was efficacious for their initial salvation, but which goes on availing for them right the way through. And it's that, from that point of view, I want to look at this great story with you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. It doesn't say I will pass by you, but I will pass over you. And I understand that the Hebrew word pass over is certainly not pass by you, but I will pass over you, I will hover over you, I will spread my wing over you, I will stand on guard over you, and not suffer the destroyer to come in unto you. I will fight your battle for you. I will answer every opponent and all on one condition when I see the blood. Now God wants to see the blood of his dear son newly, freshly sprinkled on the doorposts of our hearts. And when he sees that blood newly, freshly sprinkled there he passes over us in the same sense in which I've indicated. He spreads his wing over us. He stands on guard over us. He answers every accusation that men or devil can level against us. He fights our battles for us. He answers our prayers. He undertakes the whole business of the victorious life for us. And all on one condition. When I see the blood. However, all too often, when he looks into our hearts, what he sees there is not a fresh sprinkled blood, a fresh sprinkling of the blood of Jesus, but very often sin, which has never been confessed, and never been cleansed. Sometimes what he sees sta staining the doorposts of our hearts there are possibly some long-standing sins. Sins that happened years ago, we may not have repeated them, but they've never been confessed and cleansed. And it's Finney, I think, who says that we are regarded as persisting in a sin up to this very hour, if only to, by our failure to repent of it. Which means if years ago a man was guilty of stealing, he may not have stolen anything since, but just because it's never been repented of, that man is regarded as persisting in stealing, right to this day. If, if there's perhaps some sexual impurity that's taken place in our lives, and that too has never been really truly confessed, that man is regarded as persisting in fornication to this day. And so it is. When God sees such things, looks into our hearts, sometimes he sees long-standing things, not necessary, such as I've mentioned, it could be anything. Or it may be the day-to-day -day things that go wrong in our attitudes and reactions, even as believers. 
he sees the resentment or the hurt feeling or the self-pity or the jealousy or the irritation and many a time I have to confess sometimes when I've stood, sat in a meeting there's been a bit of a fuss and a bit of a rush to get to the church on time and in the rush hard words sharp words have been spoken and there have I been sitting trying to worship but when God has looked at my heart he sees those things staining the doorpost of my heart and these things are not only things that have come between us and God that is staining the lintel of the door but many of them have come between us and other people they relate to other people their wrong attitudes to them, wrong reactions oh they were wrong in their actions but friend you were just as wrong in your reaction reactions of anger reactions of annoyance or resentment and there they are not only staining the lintel but also the side post of the door and when he sees our sin staining the doorpost of our hearts he's unable to do what he otherwise would stand over us spread his wing over us fight our battles for us answer every accusation for us and we are left to trust, try to struggle on living the Christian life in our own strength there's a verse in the Psalms which says if I regard iniquity in my heart the Lord will not hear me and maybe you've often heard that uh, that, that uh, people mention who uh, touching on that verse have said that if I regard means if I regard with favor iniquity in my heart what does it mean to regard sin with favor very simple it's by justifying it and maybe there's something happened some attitude been adopted and we won't call it sin we excuse it we justify it and that is regarding iniquity with favor and when and that is the case the word tells us he will not hear us and we're in the terrible pathetic position of having to try and be effective Christians and maintain testimony when the Lord is no longer with us in power as he once was but 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 when he sees the blood of Jesus covering those things sprinkled on the doorpost of our hearts and ourselves newly humbled before him in penitence it matters not what it is that's been there such is the power of the precious blood of Jesus he returns with life and fullness to the soul he passes over us he hovers over us once again spreads his wing over us and answers every accusation from devil or man leveled against us because now he's seeing the blood applied to those things it's one thing to preach the blood it's another thing to apply the blood it's one thing to believe in the blood the great thing is are we applying it and when he sees it applied to that which needs it you cannot be more right with God than what the blood of Jesus makes you when you call sin sin you can't have a better righteousness before God than that of the blood when at last you take a sinner's place over any issue and with joy you lift up your head again and you find yourself in an extraordinary new relationship which was never there when, be when before you were struggling away at last you've consented to call it sin and the blood of Jesus has been applied to that thing and when he sees the blood he passes over you you're forgiven, you're cleansed you're put in completely right relationship with Jesus again it couldn't be better than what the blood affects for you when we take, call the thing sin when I see the blood the great thing is what he wants to see when I see the blood now it's at this point I think that we do often make a mistake it's easy to understand it didn't need much revelation just now for you to understand that when he sees sin unconfessed staining the doorposts of our hearts the, the long standing things or the day to day things that he's unable to spread his wing over us 
and take up our case it doesn't need much revelation to see that and we assume that we know what the answer is then and we assume that the alternative to him seeing sin staining our hearts is for him to see no sin that the alternative to him seeing defeat in our lives is for him at last to see victory in our lives that the alternative to him seeing impatience there with one another or the children in our hearts for his to see sweetness there and we make it our great business to put those things on the door we long to have victory if only I can get victory that will put things right between me and God and when he sees that all will be well between me and him we long to be holier and sweeter and we try our best to be like that confident that if only you can see something of that order that will put things right and as I say that's what we strive to do and that for some of us can be virtually the whole of our Christian life one long endeavour to hang up holiness to hang up victory on the doorposts of our hearts and though that at first sight seems so right it just isn't God's way and that for several reasons first it means that we're trying to make up by our efforts for that which has been lost by sin oh we've lost peace we've lost the joy of our salvation but we're trying to make up by our efforts by our resolve by our determination to be better for that which was really in the first place lost by sin and I would say there was a time in my life when that really was what I was trying to do although at the time I was an evangelist I seemed to have got out of step with God I seem to have lost what I thought I once had of power and my service became one long chore and I tried so hard to make up for that loss of life and liberty and power by my efforts when in reality I had to see it had been lost by sin and you know Christian service is no answer to the Christian sin and yet so often that's our way and then this way that looks at first uh, to be so right is proved not to be God's way because you never quite succeed in hanging up those things on the doorpost of your heart you promise you try you vow you walk the aisle again but it never succeeds and the attempt to hang up a real degree of holiness only lands us in despair for the good that we would we don't do and the evil that we would not that we do and if we took our attempts to get right with God this way seriously we would soon end as it, as it brought uh, Paul to oh wretched man oh wretched Christian that I am who should deliver me and this way of seeking peace with God always if you take it seriously enough leads you to despair how do you walk with God how do you know peace when all these things all the time these things are coming at us and we're reacting to them and then too I believe the attempt to get right with God by means of hanging up our holiness or attempts at it is really another way of dodging repentance we are offering God our new start in lieu of our repentance and I believe that's the reason why the way of works is refused by God not merely that for theological reasons he has decided that salvation is going to be by grace and not by works but much deeper because works is so often a way of avoiding repentance I've got a book at home I've got a number of books that I've got on my shelves for their titles I haven't read all of these but they're good enough just for their titles worth the money I pay just to have that title staring at me and the book I'm thinking of is this what do you think of this for a title of a book The Art of Dodging Repentance and really and truly your attempts to be nicer and so kind 
even to your wife can be a dodging of repentance God wants you to say you're wrong and ask forgiveness of him and of her or of him, the husband sometimes there's been some few words sharp words at breakfast and the man can't wait any longer he's got to get to work off he goes, gets to his car and that's how he leaves home but he's a Christian and he feels a bit bad about that that wasn't the way to leave his dear wife and so on the way home he stops at a store and buys a box of candy and he comes back with candy well I'm sure she's glad to see the candy and I'm sure she's glad to realize that that probably means his attitude has changed but he doesn't put things right it takes a lot of candy to take away sin <laughs> what God requires is that man to humble himself honey I was wrong and not to imply that she was wrong too no no I'm the one who's wrong then it really is right because then the blood of Jesus is applied to that thing which we repent but if there is a way of getting by and getting on peacefully which does not involve the humbling business of saying I'm wrong of repenting we'll take it and so often the way of work, our efforts, our polite substitutes for humbling ourselves before God at the foot of the cross and having the blood of Jesus applied to us. And though it does seem so reasonable to think that the alternative for him seeing defeat in our lives is for him to see victory, it's not the way. It doesn't work. And that for some of the reasons I've mentioned. But what does it say here? Not when I see these things on the doorpost, but when I see the blood upon the doorpost, upon the lintel, upon the two side posts, then I will pass over you. Now, this then is the great chapter that speaks in a foreshadowing way of this great standing provision that God has made for the saints as well as for the sinner the blood of Jesus now our hymns often allude to it in our preaching we often do and strangely when it comes to revival always the message of the blood of Jesus assumes increasing importance but that fact may fox you deep down you may hear these words you know it's part of evangelical faith but frankly you're not quite sure what is really meant by the blood of Jesus Christ and when people give testimonies to what God's done for them through the power of that blood it really can puzzle us now this particular passage gives us the most beautiful simple picture of what is meant by the blood of Jesus when these instructions were being given to them the Lord said and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are the, the whole thing is that that blood was a token it wasn't the literal blood that secured their salvation so much as that of which that blood was a token now what was it a token of? well surely as we look at the story it was a token of judgment met God had said I'm going to execute judgment upon Egypt and upon every home in Egypt tonight but that sprinkled blood was a token of the fact that as far as that house was concerned judgment had already been there it fell upon that house as the sun was setting that night but it didn't fall on the person of the eldest son it fell upon that innocent little lamb on his behalf maybe that, that boy hesitated to kill the lamb it had become a household pet and there's nothing quite so touching and innocent and meek as a lamb and his father's now telling him to take the knife and plunge it in his breast. he said I can't dad I can't and I think that dad said to him son either that lamb dies or you do and so he had to do it 
and as far as that house was concerned judgment fell upon it when that lamb died instead of the son and the collected blood from it sprinkled on the door was a witness of that fact it was as if it spake and it said so to speak to the destroying angel thou canst not come hither judgments have already been here this blood is a token of that thing and I believe that's exactly what is meant by the blood of Jesus Christ it speaks of God's judgment of sin already fallen already completed it's fallen not on the person of the sinner but on the, on the person of the one who stood surety for the sinner I read, Pam and I read virtually every day a beautiful little book have I mentioned it to you, Daily Light? it's a book that I would regard uh, urgently suggest you purchase it was who knows the power of thine anger what a question to ask who's ever known it next verse without any comment and about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice my God my God why hast thou forsaken me do you see only one person has ever known and experienced the power of the anger of God against sin and that was Jesus that was what was happening there on the cross but listen he didn't only know it and experience it he exhausted it for he not only said on that cross why hast thou forsaken me father but he said it's finished and the anger of God burnt itself out in the breast of the Lord Jesus and the blood is the token of that thing and thus it is every, every reference to the blood in hymnology or in scripture always has this blessed connotation of a judgment that's over and finished a victory that's been won on behalf of the sinner by Jesus that's the reason why when you get certain hymns about the blood there's always a rhythm and a lilt about them hymns about the cross the good Friday hymns are solemn oh sacred head once wounded and such and so on they speak about the brokenness of the deity taking the blame himself when it really was ours and dying there but hymns about the blood some have thought them really irreverent you don't sing like that oh yes you do because it's joyous the thing's over the victory's been won judgment has been met and I don't need to have any hangover of guilt I don't need to labour on the feeling with the feeling that God's still disapproving of me all disapproval was finished by Jesus and the blood is a token of that fact can you not see then how right it was when I see the blood I understand it if you don't and you don't have to understand it all provided you've got it sprinkled in your heart it's God who sees it and he knows what it means and it satisfies him it's enough for God shown by the fact that he raised his son from the dead if Jesus had not paid the debt he ne'er had been a freedom set and when God sees that holy all sufficient blood covering those things which until they were repented of caused him to withdraw his presence he returns he passes over he stands over you he takes up the whole battle again and you're restored to relationship with Jesus and he's undertaking your all to be when he sees the blood and there's nothing more important for us to learn is how to apply the blood quickly without delay humbly and you do it by putting yourself in the wrong when I see the blood well when does he see the blood when you put yourself in the wrong when you repent now to put ourselves in the wrong is usually the last thing we want to do our natural reaction is always to justify ourselves 
I'm right. The other fellows are wrong. They're accusing me wrongly. No, God, I think you've got it wrong too. I'm right. But when you repent, to repent simply means you change your mind. And where before you said, I'm right and you're wrong, you said to God, oh God, you're right and I'm wrong. That's when he sees the blood. And large or small things, things of action or things of reaction, things of attitude, as the Holy Spirit shows you these things as you walk in the light that reveals everything, you say, yes Lord, that's right. And the blood is applied. That's when the blood is applied, when I call sin, sin. The blood of Jesus only covers and cleanses that which we call sin. And so, in tried, instead of trying to be better, we want to be those who are quick to admit we're wrong. I say that again. Instead of trying to be better, especially that particular thing and trying to make up for it in some way or other, Instead of trying to do better, be quick to admit you're wrong. And what happens? Inasmuch as this blood was shed for sin, it's applied to it. You had the faith to believe that you're a candidate for that precious blood. It's custom made, or provided for you. And when God sees the blood, you're restored and you're as right with God as you can possibly be. And you find yourself on new ground with God. Frankly, it's better for the blood to be applied than for you to prove your innocence. If you're innocent, okay. You're not going to get too much from a God of grace. An innocent man is hardly a candidate for grace, is he? Grace is for those that don't deserve it. But the moment I take my place as a wrong one and come to Jesus again, for the blood to be sprinkled afresh in my heart, I want to tell you there's nothing that God won't do for a man like that. He'll become an object of divine grace on a scale he never thought possible. He's treated in a way which he doesn't deserve. Because God seeing the blood is a great thing to exchange the ground of your innocence for the ground of the blood. And in this way, the devil could overstep himself. Even the very thing which trips you up, if acknowledged, becomes the occasion of getting on the ground of the blood again where there's peace the ground of grace oh wondrous peace that's the place you're on the ground of grace and I want to tell you when he sees the blood you needn't worry whether he's going to bless whether he's going to use you when he sees the blood and I can't tell you the numberless times when I've enjoyed peace with God by the blood this way when he sees the blood you don't have to have any hangover of guilt even as you walk, it can, it can happen. And it's so complete. If, having been cleansed, you find that the devil has come again and you've reacted again, you might feel, feel like saying, Oh God, here I am. I've done it again. And you know what he'll say to you if you say that? He'll say, What have you done again? I have no record that this thing's ever happened in my book. As far as I'm concerned, this is the first time you've ever come. Such is the power of the blood. And you're not left carrying even the memory or the load of former such things. There's no record. And you're free. There's been a recurrence of that word, being set free. Jim mentioned it. Some of the songs mentioned it. The solo did. Free! You're not laden down. And it's by the blood of Jesus that the heart is made free. I remember at our conference, we have a conference, have done for 30 years in Britain, uh, run by a team of us, a growing team of men who've discovered something of the way of revival for their own hearts. And we have big numbers really, 500 a week for four weeks running, different parties coming every Saturday. And every Saturday is a tremendous day for us. Hundreds of people go, hundreds of other people come. And uh, for years I was responsible for most of the organisation. And I remember one Saturday when there was this big changeover. 
I was rushing here, rushing there, instructing the staff here, attending to guests there. And you know, I got irritated right the way through that day. I'm ashamed to say. Irritated with the staff. Why didn't they think of doing that? And the guests, fancy asking for that favour at this particular day of all days. And so on. Mercy didn't come out of my mouth. But it came, it was in my heart. And staining my heart. But as I went, dashing around I said yes Lord that's right that's it yes Lord that's it at the, towards the end of the day most of the guests had come but there was one or two of the team who hadn't come and one of those brothers I was expecting to give the first message of the conference of the Saturday night and he hadn't showed up or he wasn't ready for it and it was obvious there was only one person who, who would have to take it and that was me I said me after a day like this and had I not known the power of the blood of Jesus I would have said I'm no, not in no shape to take that and I don't know that I did have all that faith in the power of the blood except for the fact that when I withdrew for a few short moments of quiet to think about what the message should be I thought at first sight that I'd have to spend those moments slogging away and having a special time of prayer to pray my way back into favour with God with all these reactions that had been in my heart I found it wasn't so my heart was as fresh as a daisy to my surprise life and light flooded in and I knew why as I said yes Lord, yes Lord the blood of Jesus had been cleansing me from sin and at the end of the day there was no record of it no trace of it for such is the power of the blood of Jesus and in the simplest way God gave a beautiful little message and people were blessed from that very first day when I see not your big praying trying to recover and try to make up for your lack of praying when I see the blood there's many a time when I've been convicted of lack of praying of lack of burden for the meeting and I'm on the platform about to give a message and the Lord says you haven't had a real burden for this you haven't really been at my feet well what do I do in the, la in the hymn before the message or before the solo during the solo have a last few minutes of praying trying to, to make up for my lack oh no I've learned to do nothing of the sort but to acknowledge the truth of what he showed me when I see the blood he says I'll do the rest and again and again God's blessed those meetings as tremendously if I spent three hours agonizing in prayer and it all happened because I saw it I was convicted and I repented and he saw the blood when I see the blood I will pass I will pass over you I remember having to go across England on a Saturday for a Youth for Christ, for Christ rally and uh, as when the day came I really hadn't given the message for that day any thought it had been a busy week and I don't know probably my own fault that I hadn't but I hadn't but I said it'll be alright I've got, I've got time for this journey I'll allow adequate time I won't go uh, to a great, too great a speed I'll drive uh, peacefully along and I'll be praying and thinking on my way to the meeting when I get to the other end I will have tea with, at the home of the friend to which I was going I know there will be time after tea between that meal and the meeting for me to go to my bedroom and have a time of prayer a final time of prayer and preparation and I will go to the meeting all blessed up and prayed up it didn't work out that way it didn't work out that way there was a something went wrong or sounded as if it went wrong with my engine and under the hood there were strange noises and of course you have all know did you ever read that article years ago in Reader's Digest a man's love affair with his car you know and to some of us who like cars cars are very special and when something sounds a bit funny that's real disturbing and it was to me I wondered what that was I stopped at the garage they didn't know I was doing no praying 
I was doing no, doing no thinking about what was coming. I was just worrying my way for several hundred miles. And it was obvious that I wasn't going to get to the home of my friend in time for that meal before the meeting. So I called him. I said, look, I can't make it in time for the meal, but I'll be at the church in time for the meeting. Okay, that's all right. That's what we want. If you're there, that's fine. And so I eventually made my way and got outside the church and fortunately near the church there was a little restaurant I went in there and sat down with my Bible and I had about 15 minutes before the meeting started and you know the natural thing would have been to spend those 15 minutes frantically trying but the Lord said you do nothing of the sort just tell me where you are and what you haven't got you know to know what I haven't got? Well, I'll tell you, Lord, I haven't got any peace. Bye. Don't try and get any. Just tell me you haven't got it. What else? Well, I haven't got any love. I don't love these people. I'm not really concerned that anybody should be saved. I'm just concerned in how in the world I'm going to get through this predicament with a great mighty rally and I haven't got a sermon for them. All right, got no love. What else? Well, I haven't got any faith. I don't expect anything to happen, being quite frank. You see, the natural thing would be try and get some love and try and get some faith and claiming some promises. The Lord said, don't do it. Just tell me what you haven't got. I haven't got any faith. And so it went down the line. And I found it strangely restful. And you know, in a few minutes, I felt, I began to feel that there was a place at the foot of the cross which was custom made for me. And I felt there was peace because the blood had been applied to all my deficiencies. I began to understand that's what he wanted to see when I see the blood. Not your frantic last minute, I want to see the blood. And so I got peace. But time was getting on. And then I said, Lord, you do know there's a, a meeting to start in a few minutes. <laughs> and you know, Lord, that I'm supposed to preach at it. Yes. But the great thing is you spent pretty well all the available time talking to me and getting right with me by the blood. That's all I really wanted. And at the last moment I opened my Bible to the fly leaf and there were some old tatty notes of a sermon I'd given before which had long since died on me. But as I looked at those tatty old notes in a matter of seconds I knew that was God's word. And I walked across the street. And you know that night down the aisle they came from all quarters the rooms at the back of the church were full of seeking souls and counsellors praying with them and everybody was praising the Lord for a mighty victory in our midst they little knew how narrowly that victory came <laughs> if I'd spent that time striving there'd have been no nothing doing but oh I'd learnt the power of the blood of Jesus I was wrong to have been in that situation that's the point I admitted it I said Lord I'm, I'm wrong just fine that's what the blood's for and when you see that you can afford to put yourself in the wrong and you get onto God, on, into relationship with God on the new ground altogether and oh what things happen yes the blood's got to be applied not only on the top the lintel but on the side post those things will come between you and another I tell you relationships get healed love flows and you'll be glad and happy to give a testimony when you've got peace with God through the blood of the Lamb. Amen. And so here's our word. When I see the blood, I will pass. I will pass over you. What a comfort. In Hebrews it talks about the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Abel's blood for vengeance pleaded to the skies, but the blood of Jesus for our pardon Christ what does that phrase the blood of sprinkling mean I suggest it means the blood for sprinkling God's standing provision for you he doesn't expect you to get along on the road to glory without using that precious blood it's blood for sprinkling and maybe there's something that needs the sprinkling of the blood in your life today 
something you haven't really called sin you haven't really believed in the power of the blood you haven't stepped into liberty with regard to that thing you can take that step with that first thing maybe there will be a second thing you'll see and you'll find this blood of Jesus is constantly available and I don't know any other way of blessing of revival of renewal when I see the blood I will pass I will pass over you let's bow our heads